this um oh are, are we are we, we good are now, we are now good and recording ah, excellent okay i would like to welcome everybody to this week's um, seminar series our speakers today are students in our phd program Juthika Thacker and Jahid Hassan, and they will each be introduced separately by their own major professors. Before we get to that, I just want to, as usual, thank our co-sponsors, the Global Public Health Minor, the School of Public and Community Health Sciences, and also the Institute of Health and Humanities. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn things over to our first speaker and, uh, and their professor. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Sophia Newcomer and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Public and Community Health Sciences. I am delighted to introduce Juthika Thaker. Juthika is a second year student in our doctoral program in public health studies. Before joining us at UM, Juthika earned her Master's of Health Administration at the University of Missouri. And before that, she trained um, as a dentist in her native country in, of India, and, and she also worked in clinical research there. Um, during her two years here at the University of Montana, Juthika has become an integral um, part of what we lovingly call Team Vaccine, which um, is just a group of researchers, students, and staff that are working on different projects related to vaccine uptake. Um, particularly in rural areas. So with that, I will turn it over to Juthika. Thank you, Dr. Newcomer, for the lovely introduction. Let me go ahead and share my slides. Okay. Do you see my slides? All right. Um, Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jyotika and I'm a doctoral student in public health at the uh, School of Public and Community Health Sciences. And today I'm going to be talking about my research topic that is engaging non-physician providers in improving the human papilloma virus vaccination rates in Montana. So um, I wanted to start my uh, presentation by just briefly uh, talking about the different types of papilloma strains and uh, what kind of illnesses they cause. So to begin with, there are more than 300 papilloma virus species that have been identified and sequenced, including over 200 human papilloma viruses. Um, 17 strains have been identified that can cause precancerous lesions or malignancies, and hence they're categorized as oncogenic. Um, about 90% of uh, all cervical cancer cases in the United States, about 88% of anal cancer cases, about 70% of vulvar, vaginal, and oropharyngeal cases, and 60% of penile cases occurring every year in the United States are attributed to HPV. An estimated 79 million Americans are currently infected with HPV, making it one of the most common sexually transmitted infection with about 14 million new infections emerging per year. 50% of all new cases occur in the highest risk group of 15 to 24 year olds, and hence the emphasis on vaccinating before uh, adolescent reaches this age group. 80% of the people would have had uh, been infected with at least one strain of HPV uh, by the time they turn 50 years. One in 100 sexually active adults have genital warts in the United States at any point in time, and roughly about 4,000 women in the US die of cervical cancer every year. So to continue with this discussion, um, there have been 40 types of HPV strains that have been identified at mucosal sites of infection. They are further classified as high-risk oncogenic and low-risk non-oncogenic, and the high-risk oncogenic are, uh, are reported to cause different types of malignancies and uh, cancer precursors. And the low-risk uh, non-oncogenic types are known to cause genital warts, laryngeal papillomas, or low-grade cervical disease. Approximately 80 types of uh, viral strains have been identified at cutaneous sites of infection, and these are most commonly uh, noted to cause uh, hand and foot warts. So now diving deeper into uh, how HPV-associated cancer distribution looks like in the United States, as we can see, cervical cancer is the most common HPV-associated cancer among females with about 10,900 cases per year and oropharyngeal cancers are the most common among males uh, with about 13,500 cases per year. Um, 
So out of all the oropharyngeal cases and anogenital cases that, uh, that uh, emerge every year in the United States, about 79% were attributed, attributable to HPV. And about 92% of all these HPV attributable cancers could have been prevented with a, with a vaccine. Um, so talking about vaccine in 2006 to protect against these different HPV associated illnesses, a quadrivalent vaccine was uh, authorized for use. Um, quadrivalent, it protects against four different strains of virus. That's why it's called quadrivalent. Um, in 2009, a bivalent vaccine was introduced to protect against the highly oncogenic strains of 16 and 18 by a different pharmaceutical company. And these two vaccines were authorized for use in females initially ages uh, nine to 26 years. Um, in 2010, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices expanded this recommendation to also include males in this particular age group. So in 2014, um, as we noted on this slide, a nine valent vaccine that protects against nine different strains of uh, HPV uh, virus was introduced in the market. And uh, currently, since 2016, this is the only vaccine that is available for use in the US. Other uh, bi bivalent and quadrivalent vaccines continue to be used in other parts of the world. And uh, with the recommendations, this vaccine is routinely recommended at age 11 to 12 years, but uh, medical providers are encouraged to start talking about the HPV vaccine and start and kind of start counseling their patients at, as early as nine years. And catch-up vaccination is recommended for all persons through age 26 if they're not adequately vaccinated. Uh, depending on the age at the dose, at the first dose, a two-dose series or a three-dose series is recommended. Um, and shared clinical decision-making regarding HPV vaccination is recommended for some adults who age 27 through 45 years who are not adequately vaccinated and are most likely to benefit from the vaccine. So now I wanted to touch base on the safety profile and the effectiveness data of the human papilloma virus vaccine. So as I said, the uh, Gardasil 9 is the only available vaccine currently in the United States, and it has been extensively studied in clinical trials. Here in the United States, uh, these trials have recruited more than 15,000 males and females, but uh, Gardasil 9 and the other vaccines have also been studied extensively outside of the United States where these vaccines are available. And the vaccine adverse event reporting system is, uh, is basically a, a frontline spontaneous uh, system that is run by the CDC and the FDA in collaboration. And it, is, uh, it actually is used to identify any potential safety, uh, uh, any potential safety defects in the vaccine. Uh, so far, it has reported data on 28 million doses of Gardasil 9 that has been distributed in the United States, and only 7,244 reports of adverse events have been reported, out of which 97% of, of the adverse events are classified as non-serious. So this shows that the HPV vaccine has a good safety profile. In the UK, uh, Gardasil 9 has been studied, and there has been no evidence reported of in, in association with any other autoimmune or uh, any other neurological complications. Uh, available evidence also indicates lasting immunity, which does not wane over time. And if you look at this graph on this slide, we can see that there has been a significant reduction in HPV-associated infections and precancers after the vaccine was authorized for use in the United States. So, you, so we would expect that a vaccine which is um, so effective and has a great, great uh, safety profile would also have a good coverage in the United States. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And this is the data that came out in 2019. And as we can see, the HPV vaccine initiation rates are at 71.5%. And the HPV vaccine completion rates, and this is for both males and females, has been at 54.2%, which is really low. Uh, the lowest series completion rates was reported from Mississippi at just 30.5%. And the highest series completion was reported from Rhode Island at 78.9%. And I must add here that in 2015, Rhode Island uh, mandated HPV vaccine as a school entry requirement. Uh, and it, and it, the requirement was gender neutral and this could have contributed to these high completion rates in Rhode Island. Moving on, so, so what, what does low HPV vaccination rates entail? It actually, if the HPV coverage remains low, that, that means that the burden of cancer in the future is higher. And as we can see from this map, even uh, which shows age standardized rate for uh, estimated cervical cancer mortality, 
And when we compare the mortality rates in the US with other countries like UK and Australia, we do have a higher cancer burden. Um, in fact, Australia is headed on to become the first country to completely eliminate cervical cancer. And it has been uh, able to achieve this by two national programs. One is uh, HPV school-based vaccination program for both sexes, which uh, Australia implemented since 2007, and a national cervical uh, cancer screening program. So it has it is also reported by that by 2034, uh, the Australia will have one will have just one new case of cervical cancer per 100,000 women. Even in UK, where the NHS uh, covers the HPV vaccine, more than 88% of uh, age eligible females have completed the vaccination course. In Denmark, with 85% vaccination rates, the incidence of genital warts has dropped down to just zero from 2% in the general population. So in light of these low vaccination, HPV vaccination coverage, the Healthy People 2030 goals emphasizes the need to increase the proportion of adolescents who get recommended doses of the HPV vaccine. And the target current and the target for the, these 2030 goals is 80%. I must also add here that this, so 80% was the goal for the 2030 uh, Healthy People goals, but we couldn't achieve that. And so it has been pushed to 2030 Healthy People goals. The other one is emphasizing the need to reduce the infections of HPV types prevented by the vaccine in young adults. And here the target is to reduce the rates from 15.1% in 2013, 16 to 8.7% in 2030. So moving on to Montana, what, how does the uh, landscape of HPV associated cancer distribution look like? And as we can see, it's very similar to the trends that we observe in the United States. Um, cervical cancer is the most common HPV associated cancer among women uh, and oropharyngeal among men. As we can see, the HPV associated cancer rates are more, more in women as compared to men in Montana. And uh, I would like to, so, so the, the, case, the new cases or the incidence rate of new cases in Montana women for HPV associated cancer distribution has remained uh, stable at 13 new cases per 100,000 women in the last two decades. However, if you look at the rates of HPV associated cancers in Montana men, it has risen by 47% in the last 15 years, which is a cause of concern. In Montana, about 80% of all HPV associated cancer in men are oropharyngeal cancer. Uh, and, uh, we, and it's actually dubbed as the fastest rising cancer among young white men in the United States. So let's move, let's look at the vaccination rates in Montana. Despite the well-documented role of HPV vaccine in cancer prevention, the series initiation and completion rates have considerably lagged in Montana. It ranks fifth lowest in terms of vaccine series initiation and eighth lowest in terms of series completion among males and females when compared to other states or to the national data. Um, in recognition of this, Montana State Health Improvement Plan also emphasizes on increasing rates of HPV vaccine initiation to about 70% by 2023. So if you look at these two graphs at the bottom, even when you compare the rates, the series initiation and completion rates in Montana to other Northwestern states, Montana has one of the lowest uh, HPV coverage rates. And if you probe these rates a little further, we see that there is a pronounced urban rural disparity that has remained consistent over the years. And if you just look at the data that came out in 2019, uh, we can also uh, presume that uh, these rates, the, the disparity might even be widening. So with this in mind, uh, there has been extensive research that has been done nationally to understand the barriers to HPV vaccine uptake in rural areas. But uh, I wanted to talk about three different uh, domains here that also resonates with the research that was done in Montana uh, by Dr. Newcomer and her team. And uh, first one is the lack of strong provider recommendations. So previous studies or the research has shown that uh, uh, parents or patients who receive a strong provider recommendation are four to five times more likely to get the HPV vaccine. But uh, only 70% of teens residing in rural areas reported 
receiving a provider recommendation as compared to 77% teens residing in urban areas. So uh, one of the hypotheses uh, to support these research findings is that uh, providers in rural areas may be less comfortable discussing the HPV vaccine. Also, there is a relative shortage of pediatricians in rural areas and non-pediatrician providers may be less familiar with vaccine recommendations for adolescents, thereby not giving out a strong uh, provider recommendation for the vaccine. The other domain is irregular well-child visits. So rural teens were less, it was reported that rural teens are less likely to have had 11 to 12 year old well-child visit, suggesting that access to care may contribute to disparity. And in an event where you miss these preventive well-child visits, um, the likelihood of receiving a strong medical provider also decreases dramatically. And the last one is our missed opportunities. So adolescents are uh, recommended vaccines other than the HPV, like the Tdap and meningococcal. And if you look at this graph on this slide, uh, we can see that the rates of these other vaccines like Tdap and meningococcal have remained higher consistently over the years, uh, but the rates of HPV vaccine co rate coverage has remained lower. Um, so, so from the previous research, there has been like uh, two different reasons that have been cited for this disparity. One is that the patient and uh, parents need greater information about the vaccine, but the providers have limited time to engage in these vaccine discussions. So this provides for a good opportunity to engage non-physician providers in, uh, and, and these non-physician providers are well equipped with the knowledge and they are better positioned to give out this information uh, to the parents about the HPV vaccine and to engage them in vaccine discussions. Uh, however, uh, nationally, the research that has been done has only focused on uh, physicians in the, and their role in, in these vaccine conversations. But in a large rural state like Montana, these non-physician providers actually uh, play a key role in, uh, pre in providing preventive care services. Uh, to support this, uh, research has also shown that teen, uh, like adolescents residing in rural areas are more likely to use public health facilities to get vaccinations. And in a state like Montana, nurses could be the sole provider in these public health departments. And hence, it's very important to understand the attitudes and beliefs of these non-physician providers like nurses and medical assistants regarding HPV vaccine. So in consideration of this, I uh, wanted to uh, extend my research efforts in this area. The overarching goal of my project is to understand how to engage this non-physician provider population in improving the human papillomavirus vaccination rates in Montana. And I plan to achieve this goal uh, through three different aims. First is to determine the role of nurses and medical assistants in promoting HPV vaccination in Montana. This is an ongoing study, it's collecting data. For the aim to, uh, I'm going to determine the role, perceived needs, barriers, and facilitators to engaging dental providers in HPV vaccine promotion in Montana. Now, you may ask why dental providers? So as I said, uh, oropharyngeal cancers are rising. And to tackle this public health crisis, the American Dental Association and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry urge dental providers to support and to support the use and administer, administration of HPV vaccine, and also to educate themselves and their patients about the role of HPV in causing these oropharyngeal cancers. So, but however, there is a lack of data as to whether dental providers in Montana are actually following these guidelines. So this is the reason I also want to work this professional group and understand their attitudes and beliefs about the vaccine. And my aim three revolves around uh, missed opportunities. I, I intend to identify county level, social demographic and access to care factors that are associated with missed opportunities for HPV vaccination in Montana. And to conclude, I'm confident that my, uh, my project will have very important research implications about uh, current practices regarding adolescent immunization in Montana on ways how to engage non-physician provider and also to guide uh, the state health department uh, in their future promotion initiatives. Um, with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you all for your time. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention. Uh, at the end, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Newcomer and Dr. Uh, Gilbert Quintero's help in putting the slides together, my PhD committee members, my PhD colleagues for their valuable input, and uh, last but not the least, Team Vaccine. Thank you. And with this, I'm open for questions. Thanks, Judica. I think we have time for probably one or two questions. So if anyone has a question, I think you can just raise your hand. Oh, let's see. Great. Some questions. Katrina. 
my phone's ringing at the same time. No, I was actually just um, oh, that's sorry. Saying my that, presentation. That was a hand clap. Thank you. The, the the clapping and the raised hand looks look very similar to me in Zoom. I think Erin has a question. Yes. <laughs> Okay, come on, come across the line, Erin. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sophia. Um, Juthika, that was a great presentation, really interesting. Um, so you presented early on the um, you know state by state uh, coverage for H the HPV vaccination, including both um, boys and girls or men and women. And um, are there differences in coverage? You know, do, do girls, or is, is coverage higher in girls versus boys or or the other way? Or, or yeah, would you be able to speak to that a little bit? Um, sure. So the coverage, so there is a pronounced disparity in the rural areas between the rates. But uh, nowadays, you know, parents are, parents do understand that getting their male child vaccinated for HPV is also important. But it's, there was a disparity, but it's slowly catching up as, in, as you know, health literacy and he as health promotion and the information about the HPV vaccine is disseminated amongst, among parents of age eligible children. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Curtis, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll take a second question then we'll turn it over to Zahid. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks Juthika, that was a great presentation. I, I just wonder, and I know this is part of what you will be learning about in your research, but I wonder if you um, have any background information on um, experiences in the dental health community with um, um, promoting of non-dental related, you know, uh, uh, health prevention or disease prevention activities. Um, right. So, <clears throat> dental community has been associated in uh, in cancer prevention. Efforts like you know tobacco cessation. I have done a lot of tobacco intervention uh, work uh, back when I was I was uh, working as a dentist and alcohol uh, alcohol counseling. Uh, so that that's there. So dental community has been involved with this. There have been a lot of studies that are done in other states like uh, Utah, Minnesota, etc., who have looked at uh, the attitudes of dentists in promoting HPV uh, vaccine and uh, just looking at what are the barriers that they perceive could prevent their um, involvement in promotion activities. So there have been some uh, studies like, you know, just, just looking at what are their perceived roles. So even between two different dental groups, like professional groups like dentists and hygienists, dentists feel like, you know, this is, they are, they should, if, if a parent or a patient has questions about HPV, they should redirect them to a primary care physician. But on the other hand, dental hygienists feel like, you know, this is uh, something like, you know, that they can do. They can probably play a very active role in promoting HPV vaccine among, them, among, among the patient population. So there is some background information about this, but nothing from Montana. So it would be nice to know what, dent what uh, uh, dental providers in Montana think about this issue and how they can help. Or just, you know, just to get them start talking about what are their needs? Do they need, uh, and there was this one research that said that, uh, dental providers um, appreciate if it's a passive discussion. So they don't actively want to uh, promote the HPV vaccine or talk about it, but if the pa patient or the parent, say, has some educational material in the clinic and just glances over them and they have questions, they would be more than happy to assist them. So, so this is what has been, you know, uh, that has come out in the research studies. But again, we don't know what's happening in Montana and how uh, excited uh, dentists are about talking about this issue. So, yeah. Great, thanks Juthika. Thank you, Curtis and Aaron for those questions. Um, and Juthika, I for one am excited to hear what you will be presenting uh, next time when you uh, go further in your research and you come back and present at the Monday seminar. So with that, I will give Juthika a Zoom clap and a Zoom raise the roof, and then I'll turn it over to Curtis to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Sophia. Thanks again, Juthika. And Sophia, I was just looking for our the reactions icons. I don't think we have a raise the roof one, but maybe we maybe you could work on that. Um, so um, I'm happy to introduce uh, to you our our next speaker, um, who is also giving an informational seminar. And 
Um, Jahid Hassan is um, uh, also a second year PhD student in our School of Public and Community Health Sciences uh, Public Health Program. And um, Jahid completed his Master's of Science with the Department of Public Health and Informatics at um, Jahar, um, Jahar Yunar, maybe I'll ask him to pronounce it when he, when he gets on. I, I have a hard time with that one. I'm sorry, Jahid, but a really prominent, okay, thank you. A really prominent university in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And um, in 2019, he had a three month inter internship at the, um, the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, Bangladesh, which is a very well known and very successful program. Um, and um, so he's gonna share with us some of his um, um, knowledge about um, communicable diseases in Bangladesh. Um, currently he works um, as a research assistant on a um, NIH funded um, study of air pollution research and health. Um, and he also works with um, Dr. Aaron Simmons and myself on a NIOSH funded study of wildland firefighter health. So um, Jaheed, it's, uh, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen and um, tell us, um, share with us your, your informational seminar. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to that uh, lecture series. Uh, okay. So, there you go. Yep, looks good. Okay, uh, the uh, topic of my presentation is how Bangladesh's research organization ICDDRB fights childhood diarrheal diseases and. Uh, here is the outline of my presentation. Um, uh, at first, I will uh, discuss about Bangladesh, then I will focus on diarrhea and cholera, and then I, I will focus on International Center for Diarrhea Disease Research, Bangladesh, ICDDRB. Then um, I will briefly talk about rural rehydration solution and food saline. Then I will uh, talk about the progress of Bangladesh to reduce diarrhea diseases and interventions Bangladesh government implemented to reduce diarrheal diseases. Then I will focus on notable achievements um, of ICD-DRB. Then I will jump into the conclusion. Uh, here is the short overview of Bangladesh. Um, so you know I am from Bangladesh, so it is pleasure to inform you about Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is a South Asian country and <clears throat> Um, it shares border with India, Myanmar, and uh, Bay of Bengal to the south. Uh, before 1947, it was part of uh, British India, and after 1947, it uh, became part of Pakistan. Then in 1971, uh, it got independence from Pakistan. Dhaka is the capital city of uh, Bangladesh, and the language of the Bangladesh people is Bangla. Uh, it has the world longest sea beach and world largest mangrove forest. Um, so here are the, some photos of Bangladesh. Uh, this is the photo of farmers of Bangladesh working in paddy field. Um, then here is the floating fruit market in Bangladesh. Uh, then here is the Royal Bengal tiger. It is the uh, national animal of Bangladesh, which is, can only be found in Sundarbon, which is located in Bangladesh and India. Here is the center uh, point of uh, Dhaka city. The Dhaka is the capital of Bangladesh. Um, here's the photo of women working in the garments industry in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is the second largest uh, exporter of ready-made garments, um, just after the China and uh, countries 81% of uh, export incomes comes from um, uh, exporting garments. Here's the national parliament of Bangladesh. And then here's the national monument of Bangladesh. Um, 
people uh, commemorate the martyrs uh, who sacrificed their life during the liberation war of Bangladesh. Here's the martyr monument. Um, it is established to commemorate uh, the uh, martyr who sacrificed their life during the um, language movement um, in 1952. Here is the some sociodemographic information of Bangladesh. So the maternal mortality rate of Bangladesh is 173 deaths per 100,000 live births. Infant mortality rate uh, is 31.13 deaths per 1,000 live births. Um, sanitation facility access is 70.9% of total population. The major infectious disease uh, diseases are bacterial and protozoal diarrhea, hepatitis A and E, dengue fever and malaria are high risk in some locations in Bangladesh. Children under the age of five years underweight 21.9 percent. Population below poverty line is 21.8 percent. Literacy rate is 73.9 uh, uh, percent and life expectancy is 74.9 for three years. Um, here is the short overview of diarrhea and cholera um, globally. So uh, diarrheal disease is um, the second leading cause of death in children under five years of age. Um, diarrheal disease kill around 500,000 uh, children under five years of age each year. Uh, globally, there are ne nearly 1.7 billion cases every year of diarrheal disease. Um, diarrheal disease kill around 1,400 children every day, more than the death of AIDS, malaria, and measles combined. Uh, diarrheal diseases were responsible for an estimated 1.3 million deaths in 2013, including 45,000 neonatal deaths. Cholera is uh, caused by infection with the bacterium Vibrio cholera. There were between one 0.4 to 4.3 million cases of cholera every year, and estimated 28,000 to 142,000 people die every year due to cholera. There uh, were around 45,000 deaths of children in 2013 due to cholera. Mechanism of pathogenesis of cholera. So the sources of infections are contaminated water and food. In a epidemic phases of disease, person is the source of water uh, infection. Um, after the ingestion of contaminated water and food, bacteria multiplies inside the body and the bacteria releases uh, cholera toxin, uh, which uh, penetrates um, into the intestinal wall. Then the toxin prevents the absorption of water by the intestine leading to hypovolemic shock and dehydration. Now I will discuss about International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, Bangladesh ICTDRB. It is one of the leading global health institutes. It plays an important role in global humanitarian crisis. It is dedicated to saving lives through research and treatment in low and middle income countries. Its initial focus was on diarrheal diseases, but now focuses on infectious diseases and other threats to public health. According to the Thomson Reuters Web of Science, 18% of Bangladesh's publications come from ICDDRP. For more than 50 years, it has been carrying out high quality research, helping the government in health policy making and promoting the uptake of evidence based intervention. It is supported by 55 donor countries, including USA, UK, Canada, etc., and different organizations. So, history of ICDDRP. Uh, in 1960, Southeast Asia uh, Treaty Organization, Seattle, Cholera Research Laboratory, CRL, was established in Dhaka. During the same year, um, cholera outbroke uh, in the some part of Bangladesh, and a group of Bangladeshi and American scientists went to the Motlop, which is 50 miles away from Dhaka, and they saved a lot of life. Later, they established a cholera research uh, laboratory in the MOTLAB. The CRL soon played a key role in the development, testing, and implementation of oral rehydration solution, a treatment estimated to save uh, tens of millions of lives worldwide. 
in 1977, studies at CRL in Dhaka and Costa Rica provided definitive proof that rotavirus could be effectively treated with ORS. After the development of ORS, um, CRL received recognition worldwide, and in 1978, it received a new name as ICD-DRB. So here is the photo of um, ICD-DRB, Moakley Brands, Dhaka. I worked there for uh, three months before coming uh, in University of Montana. And <clears throat> I worked under the supervision of Dr. Jiaul Islam in the uh, Health System and Population Studies Division. My uh, primary focus of the research uh, was um, health facilities in Bangladesh during that time. Um, now we'll discuss about rural rehydration solution and food saline. So most of the um, diarrheal uh, deaths can be prevented through the prevention and treatment of dehydration. Um, or RS involves using electrolyte solutions that include sodium, glucose, and other electrolytes. When ORS mixture reaches the small intestine, the sodium glucose co-transport system is activated and the fluid mixture is rapidly absorbed, which rehydrates the body. Dr. Rufiqul Islam, who was chief scientist of ICDRB, is known for the discovery of food saline, porosaline, for the treatment of diarrhea. His uh, discovery played a key role to save lives of the people in the refugee camps during the liberation war of Bangladesh. Uh, diarrhea and age group, uh, children under five years old and older adults over 70 years uh, suffers from diarrheal diseases more than any other age group. It is one of the main causes of morbidity and mortality in children under five years of age. So here is the graph of diarrheal disease by age. The um, blue color represent the uh, deaths of diarrheal disease of children under five years and the green color represent the death of uh, diarrheal from diarrheal disease of older adults over 70 years old. Here is the graph of child deaths and cases of diarrheal diseases by cause. 27% so of diarrheal cases are due to rotavirus, 11% of diarrheal cases are due to cholera, 13% of diarrheal cases are due to shigella, 11% of diarrheal cases are due to adenovirus. There are some uh, other viruses, bacteria and protozoa that are directly responsible for uh, diarrheal diseases. Income and diarrheal diseases. There is a negative relationship with GDP of a country and diarrheal diseases. Most of the outbreak of diarrheal disease happen in the underdeveloped and developing countries in Africa and South Asia. At lower level of income, these factors for diarrheal diseases, such as lack of access of clean water, rotavirus vaccine, vaccine unavailability, undernutrition, stunting, and other are the most prevalent. Here is the graph of death rate from diarrheal disease for every country. Um, we can see that um, the most of the deaths occurs in the sub-Saharan African countries and Southeast Asian countries. And the um, red arrow represents uh, the Bangladesh. Yeah, red arrow indicates the Bangladesh. So reduction of diarrheal disease in Bangladesh. Bangladesh was one of the countries with highest death rate due to diarrheal disease. But Bangladesh was able to exceed a large reduction in diarrhea uh, deaths over the past several decades, despite being a resource constraint and densely populated country. In 2017, the death rates dropped three per million people in Bangladesh. From 2003 to 2017, mortality from diarrhea dropped 95% in Bangladesh. ICDDRB and other um, organizations played a key role in making policies, taking preventive and therapeutic measures for the reduction of childhood diarrheal disease in Bangladesh. So I, now I will discuss how Bangladesh was successful in reducing mortality due to diarrheal disease. So Bangladesh has uh, the world's highest coverage of oral rehydration solution use of diarrhea Involvement of non-government organizations like uh, ICDDRB, BRAC, 
and the private sector along with public sector stewardship was instrumental in popularizing oral rehydration solution. Bangladesh experienced a large drop in under five mortality from 198.9 per thousand live birth to 37.6 per thousand live births between 1980 to 2015. Over the same period, diarrhea mortality rates decreased among children under five from 15.1 per thousand to six per thousand live births. Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, BRAC, a partner of ICDDRB, provided door to door services to raise awareness of preventive and curative management of diarrhea and care seeking from trained providers. Here is the graph of mortality among children due to diarrheal diseases in Bangladesh. So the x axis uh, uh, represent the year and y axis represent the diarrhea specific mortality per thousand live birth. The blue uh, uh, line represent diarrhea specific mortality per thousand live birth and red line represents uh, percent of under five deaths due to diarrhea. We can see from the graph that between the year of 1980 to 2015, the uh, death due to diarrhea um, drop sharply <clears throat> in Bangladesh. So here is the graph of intervention Bangladesh government took by year to reduce diarrheal disease and mortality due to it. So in 1970 to 1980, government of Bangladesh introduced free deep tube web. So during that time, a lot of people, high percentage of people in Bangladesh and India used to drink water from uh, which was available in river and ponds. But <clears throat> that type of water uh, in the river and pond was the reserve of the pathogen of diarrheal diseases. So that's why uh, it was prevalent uh, at that time. So I see after that I demonstrated the effectiveness of oral rehydration solution to prevent mortality due to diarrhea. And drug started to teach mother to make their own homemade saline, which is called lobum good saline, which can be made with molasses, salt, and water. And it was cost effective also. In 1980 to 1990, uh, Bangladesh government um, established water supply and sewage authority, WASHA. And in 1989, um, Control for Diarrheal Diseases program started. Uh, BRAC um, at that time um, uh, implemented three phases of oral rehydration therapy program. During the time of 1990 to 2000, social uh, mobilization campaign was launched to popularize uh, WASH and then uh, first national policy for safe water supply and um, sanitation was undertook. Um, w is recommended uh, at the time to uh, premix or irradiation solution and control for diarrheal disease, CDD and ORT communication com campaign implemented uh, during that time. Social marketing companies, SMC's marketing campaign of oral dehydration solution became successful at that time. During the time of, of 2001 and 2010, national sanitation strategy was taken by the government of Bangladesh. Ba Bangladesh government uh, uh, took the plan for water management during that time. And WHO recommended the use of zinc and low osmolality ORS for diarrheal management during that time. Uh, during the year of 2010 to 2015, sector development plan ensured wash facilities at hard to reach areas. And Bangladesh uh, government uh, took a program called vaccine for rotavirus uh, during that time. Latest um, implemented management of childhood illness guideline ad adopted zinc supplementation for diarrhea management. So uh, here is the notable experiment of ICDDRB. In 2001, it received the first Gates Award for Global Health in recognition of its development of oral rehydration solution. In 2005, it received the Independence Day Award, Bangladesh's most prestigious national award. In 2017, ICTDB won the Conrad N. Hilton Humanitarian Prize in 
recognition of the institute's innovative approach to solving global health issues impacting the world's most in impoverished communities. In 2016, former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon noted that ICDDR-based innovations are directly contributing to sustainable development and helping reduce infant, child, and maternal mortality in Bangladesh and beyond. In conclusion, I want to say that Bangladesh is winning the war against uh, diarrhea, and Bangladesh government worked on many factors to make it successful. Uh, ICDDRB with many other organizations, organizations like BRAC and SDDP played a key role to make it successful. And Bangladesh set an example for lower and middle income countries uh, to reduce the mortality and morbid morbidity due to diarrheal diseases. And though Bangladesh uh, is winning the war against diarrhea, malnutrition is, is still prevalent is, and high in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh government should focus on that right now. So here's the reference. And that's all for the timing. Thanks to all of my committee members and thanks to all. And special thanks to Dr. Nonan for uh, helping me throughout my PhD journey. Thank you. Any question? Great, yeah. Thank you, Shahid. We do have time for a, for a question or two. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Anyone? Um, I can start with a question if no one's got one right ready. Um, so Jahid, I noticed that um, um, when you presented the global data of um, diarrheal disease mortality over time, that all of the reductions are in children under five, which is great. I mean, obviously that's where the target was for certainly for ICDDRB and other organizations and and as that being the most vulnerable population and most at risk of death from diarrheal disease but it it looks like we're now even at a point where other age populations maybe it are at equal risk from under five more from from those populations under five and are there but but there hasn't been any change in that mortality according to that figure and is that do you think that that is due to the fact that those are more difficult populations to to work on in terms of preventing diarrheal disease related deaths or has there just not been an effort to do that um okay that is a good good question i think um the measures are uh taken proper measures are taken but uh for Global and for Bangladesh, the population is rising, and some other factors is also um, uh, that are including um, over the time, like uh, the density and uh, rising of the slum of, in the cities that, that made it, I think, difficult to um, to made uh, to reduce the death for the other. Um, uh, health group, other groups to, yeah, to reduce the morbidity and mortality. And I think uh, to work on those factor, like improvement of the uh, living condition in the slum, in the cities of, of the countries and other factor um, can help to reduce the um, death rate in other health group also. Thanks, Yahid. There, there's also a question here from Dr. Quintero about climate change. Do you know, can you share anything with us about um, the impact of climate change on diarrheal disease in Bangladesh? Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, there has a direct relationship with uh, the climate change and uh, the diarrheal disease in Bangladesh and the uh, countries in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. Um, the, uh, due to the climate change, the weather pattern in is changing and uh, because of that flood and other natural disaster is uh, frequent in Bangladesh and India nowadays. And during the flood, um, the diarrheal diseases are more uh, frequent than other time. So, um, like that the flood and other natural disaster is increasing and 
for that, I think um, the climate change has direct relationship on it. Thanks, Shahid. I think we'll turn it back over to Kimber now. If you have any um, closing remarks, other or is there another question? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, you mentioned food saline, and you yeah. named the name of a product. Could you tell us briefly about that, and maybe mention what the name of the product is? So uh, the food saline uh, is um, uh, served with uh, the uh, ingredient like uh, electrolytes uh, with the food. And uh, uh, it, I, I mentioned that in 1971, during the liberation war, uh, there were outbreak of cholera in the refugee camp. Um, and the food saline um, had a key role to prevent or reduce the death at that time. So um, the formula of food saline, I can say that it, it is a mixture of the ingredient of the saline with the food, uh, like uh, nutritious food. Um, and the uh, people of Bangladesh uh, during that time, and even now the uh, main source of food, our main food of Bangladesh is rice. and um, vegetables. So uh, uh, during that time, one scientist from ICDRB called Dr. Rufiul Islam, he invented the rice saline and um, that saved the life of many people. Thanks. Well, thank you for those questions and the presentations, Juthika and Jahid. That was very interesting and um, good answers to the questions you received. So that's it for today. I just wanted to remind everybody that next week, our lecture in this series will be presented by Katherine Sanders, who is the director and evaluation consultant with Expanding Opportunities of Kenya. And she's going to be presenting uh, a presentation entitled A Healthy Business, Evaluation of a Program for Rural Entrepreneurs in and with Social Safety Nets in East Africa. So join us for that talk next week at two. And thanks, everybody. We'll sign off here.